Throughout history, crime waves have emerged due to a variety of reasons, ranging from societal issues like poverty and injustice to inexplicable occurrences such as the peculiar wig-jacking crime wave of the 18th century or the rioting over straw hats in the early 20th century. Back in the day, fashion rules were no joke. They were actual laws, and breaking them could land you in serious trouble, like in medieval England where people were punished for wearing the wrong colors or fabrics based on their social status. And if the government wasn't policing fashion, then the public took matters into their own hands, leading to violent hat riots in America. As straw hats gained acceptance as standard summertime male headgear in the late 19th century, an unwritten rule emerged that they should only be worn until September 15th, known as Felt Hat Day, leading to a tradition of friends and acquaintances playfully snatching them off each other's heads. But it eventually escalated into violent crime and widespread rioting as strangers joined in on the hat-snatching frenzy. During the 19th and early 20th centuries, the fashion rule of not wearing straw hats after September 15th was taken so seriously that anyone who defied it risked having their hats snatched and destroyed by the fashion mob leading to the formation of violent groups for mutual protection or bullying. In Pittsburgh, the end of straw hat season in 1910 led to widespread crime and violence, with mobs attacking straw-lidded pedestrians and even pulling guns to protect their headgear, narrowly avoiding serious bloodshed and loss of life. Back in 1910, American youth took it upon themselves to violently attack anyone wearing a straw hat on September 15th, making it nearly impossible to stop this bizarre fashion-related crime wave. The straw hat riot of 1922 in New York City turned into a chaotic crime spree as gangs of unruly youth targeted innocent people, snatched their hats, and unleashed widespread mayhem and violence throughout Manhattan. The 1922 Straw Hat Riot in New York City lasted for days, with widespread mayhem and traffic disruption on the Manhattan Bridge. Youth gangs armed with nail-studded clubs intensified the crime spree, targeting straw hat wearers who were lucky to escape with just losing their hats while others were brutally beaten. The rioting continued for days, spreading across Manhattan, including the Upper West Side where a mob of over 1,000 people was reported snatching straw hats on Amsterdam Avenue. After the 1922 straw hat riot, many culprits were quickly released to their parents, who were then required to spank their kids as a condition for their release, but the violent tradition persisted, leading to a murder in 1924 before straw hats eventually went out of fashion during the Great Depression. During the Victorian era, the bobbies of the Metropolitan Police Service in London were despised by many, seen as parasites who avoided honest work and lived off the taxes of honest men, leading to them being frequently mocked and attacked. The working and lower classes in Victorian times held a strong dislike for the police, who were seen as suppressing their beloved recreational activities and customs. As a result, many Victorians actively despised the police and would go to great lengths to make their lives miserable, often resorting to violent crime waves specifically targeting law enforcement officers. Approaching private residences, even for the purpose of ensuring security, was a risky endeavor for Victorian police as they faced hostility and violence from residents who resented any interference in their domestic affairs. During the Victorian era, 
Violence against police officers was not always motivated by a specific purpose, but rather for the sheer enjoyment of it, with Londoners leading bobbies on merry chases or attacking them out of the blue. Some working-class gangs even went as far as setting up elaborate ambushes, using trip wires to spring booby traps on the unsuspecting cops. During the 18th century, wigs were so valuable that they became a prime target for thieves, leading to a crime wave of wig robberies. Highwaymen in the 18th century targeted wealthy aristocrats wearing elaborate wigs, earning the nickname Big Wigs due to the valuable target on their heads, and some wig thieves even managed to replace expensive wigs with cheap rugs without their victims noticing. In centuries past, Christmas was not the peaceful holiday it is today but rather a time of drunken riots and widespread crime, with the streets transformed into chaotic scenes of free-for-all brawls. In the 1600s, celebrating Christmas was actually a crime in the Massachusetts Bay Colony due to the disorderly and crime-ridden nature of the holiday, especially for single men who would get wild and cause chaos. This trend of violent and out-of-control celebrations reached its peak in the 19th century, particularly in cities like New York and Philadelphia, where working-class young men would get drunk, dress up in unconventional attire, and engage in criminal activities during the holiday season. Philadelphia's young and intoxicated Christmas revelers, known as the Early Mummers, would gather in gangs, terrorizing neighborhoods with their off-key singing, banging on pots and cowbells, demanding free drinks, and engaging in petty crimes and acts of violence, serving as a stark reminder of the simmering class conflict in America. Authorities were powerless against the Christmas crime sprees and disorder, leading respectable citizens to condemn Christmas as a disgrace due to the black sheep who made the night hideous with their unruly behavior. In southern Illinois, Charlie Berger, a Jewish immigrant turned bootlegger and pimp, formed an alliance between hill people and miners to satisfy their thirst for alcohol, but when he clashed with his partners, it sparked a crime wave involving homemade tanks and aerial bombings. The partnership between bootlegger gangs Charlie Berger and Carl Shelton quickly fell apart due to widespread cheating in the collection and division of profits, leading to escalating violence, including an aerial bombing by the Sheltons, making it the first known in U.S. history. During the Southern Illinois Bootlegger War, Charlie Berger openly boasted about his gang's crimes, even going as far as broadcasting messages on local radio. But public opinion shifted when his gang abducted and murdered a state trooper and his innocent wife, leading to his arrest, conviction, and eventual public hanging. Zoot Suits initially embraced by African Americans in cities like Harlem, Chicago, and Detroit, soon gained popularity among jazz singers, entertainers, Italian Americans, Latinos, and Filipinos. But their ethnic origins and unique style clashed with the more conservative and racist individuals. Zoot Suits once seen as declarations of individuality and freedom, became targets of backlash during WWE 2, with wearers being verbally and physically attacked and even killed over their fashion choices. In the lead-up to the Zoot Suit riots, Los Angeles newspapers fueled racial tensions by sensationalizing a fictitious crime wave supposedly caused by Mexican-American youths 
leading to a media frenzy and unjustified arrests of hundreds of young Mexican Americans for simply wearing oversized clothing. The situation worsened with the wrongful convictions of nine young Mexican Americans for murder, which only fueled the already rampant anti-Mexican American sentiment in LA. During World War II, the wearing of zoot suits by Mexican Americans in LA was seen as unpatriotic by white military personnel, leading to a crime spree and riots targeting Latino youths, as well as African Americans and Filipinos. This marked the first time in American history that fashion sparked widespread civil unrest. From a young age, Ken Rex McElroy was trouble and his criminal activities only escalated as he grew older, terrorizing the town of Skidmore with his violent and menacing presence. McElroy's reign of terror in Skidmore was so effective that, even with numerous indictments, he managed to escape conviction as the terrified community remained silent, too afraid to testify against him. In 1971, a 37-year-old McElroy began a relationship with Trana, who was just 12 years old at the time, and two years later she became pregnant. But when she tried to escape his mistreatment, he refused to let her go. In an astonishing turn of events, Ken McElroy managed to force Trina, his victim, into a marriage to avoid facing charges of child molestation and statutory rape, despite this happening in mid-1970s America. Despite being illiterate, Ken McElroy was cunning enough to know that his intimidating reputation was his greatest defense, so he selectively targeted weaker individuals and followed through on his threats just enough to make people believe he would do what he said he would do. In April 1980, Ken McElroy's reign as the town bully came to an end when his wife, Trina, confronted the elderly owners of the local grocery store, accusing them of accusing their daughter of shoplifting, leading to a profanity-filled tirade and ultimately sealing McElroy's fate. McElroy's relentless campaign of terror against the Bowen camps included constant surveillance, gunshots in the air, and ultimately, a brutal and fatal attack on Bo Bowen camp in 1980. Skidmore's residents, desperate for help, reached out to every authority figure, pleading for action against the psychopath in their midst, but their pleas fell on deaf ears. However, when McElroy violated his bond and threatened revenge with a rifle, it was the last straw. In a final act of desperation, the people of Skidmore took matters into their own hands, confronting Ken McElroy and ultimately ending his reign of terror with a hail of gunfire, leaving him lifeless in his truck as the town retreated into the night. State troopers arrived in Skidmore to find the streets empty, except for McElroy's still-running truck, and although shell casings were recovered, the weapons used in the public killing were never found, leaving the unsolved homicide as a testament to the town's ability to keep silent. In Canada, the Ducobors went from being an odd religious sect to a dangerous one, Known for their mass nudist protests and infamous for committing massive arsons, creating one of Canada's strangest crime waves. The Daukobors, a Russian cult, migrated to Canada in 1902, but their refusal to swear allegiance to the crown led to their loss of land and bitter resentment towards the authorities. Led by Peter Verrigan, the sect established communal villages in British Columbia, where Verrigan maintained control by flogging his nudist followers with brambles. However, after Verrigan was blown up with dynamite in 1924, 
the Dukobors descended into chaos, with rival factions engaging in increasingly wild and criminal activities. This radical splinter group, which emerged after the assassination of their sect leader in 1924, went to extreme lengths to reject modern society, even resorting to religiously driven crime waves where they would burn homes and destroy possessions of Dukabors who embraced modernity, all while parading naked to mimic the simplicity of Adam and Eve. The radical Russian religious migrants known as the Freedomites shocked authorities with their mass nude parades, leading to the criminalization of public nudity and prison sentences for their naked protests. The Freedomites also turned to violent crime, raiding and destroying the homes and factories of other Dukobors as punishment for straying from their simple life. The Freedomites, a sect in British Columbia, went on a crime spree for decades, bombing and setting fire to over 1,100 targets, leading to the authorities imprisoning nude protesters and taking away their children. The violence reached its peak in 1962 with 259 bombings in one region, but the sect was finally dismantled when 60 leaders were arrested and charged with conspiracy. Since then, peace has prevailed, but the number of Canadian Ducobors has drastically decreased.